the next thing I want to talk to you about is safety. And safety is, is not the most interesting topic. And where'd I put my outline? Hang on just a second. Apologies. I didn't have a time, I didn't have a chance to type up this set of notes. So I'm going to do it on, on the handwritten really quickly, but um, it's, it's just going to summarize some important things. Okay, let me first talk to you about safety rules. Most of you guys, if you've taken chemistry at Orange Coast College, you've seen these safety rules. These are posted on the website. The one thing I want to say about these safety rules is that these are really more for general chemistry. They have some things, they, they discuss some issues that are not really applicable to organic chemistry and they omit some issues that ought to be in organic chemistry and the organic faculty we've decided, but COVID interrupted us that we need to rewrite these for organic chemistry. So um, these still apply, they're a good set of rules, but I'm gonna be talking to you about a little bit of modifications on these. Um, we are also not going to be taking a safety quiz in class this semester since um, the safety quizzes um, are available online, but they um, would require me to set up a secure testing environment and I don't want to do that. So, um, because otherwise then they, they would, you know, there would be issues of people copying. I don't know. I just don't want to get into that. Okay. So no safety quiz, but please just read through these when you get a chance, become familiar with them. What I want to do is I want to just briefly talk to you about high, I guess what I would say is an overview of safety. I know this is a little boring. I'm going to try to go fast. All righty, so all right, so let me talk to you about safety. Now, we are not actually going to be conducting experiments in the lab this semester. And so this is truly just an academic thing. Um, but it's my last chance to sort of talk to you about um, issues of safety that will follow you in your career, no matter what your career is, okay? If you have a career that involves working in a laboratory or clinical setting, okay? Safety is important in all of these settings because, you know, unlike working in just, you know, I don't know, like, oh, I'm a banker, I'm in finance, I work in an office in front of a computer. Yeah, when you work in front of a computer, you do still have to consider ergonomics and things like that. But honestly, you're unlikely to set yourself on fire, right? But in an organic lab and many other kinds of labs, yeah, you could set yourself on fire if you're not careful, right? So it's just a different set of considerations. My belief is that the most important safety practice is prevention. And most of the safety rules are focused around that. They, they sort of say, do this to prevent that an accident could occur, right? That's if you prevent an accident, then that's the safest situation you can be in, right? So um, I want you, when you look at safety rules, no matter where you go, to think about that. You know, oh, why are, you know, Prevention can be very inconvenient, right? It can be uncomfortable and inconvenient and whatever. Why are they making me do this, this and that? But the idea behind it is that if we prevent you from having a safety incident, then you're safe, right? You won't be harmed. No one else will be harmed. 
Okay. I think in our modern world, you can sort of understand that in terms of the wearing a mask and social distancing things. These are preventative measures, right? They're measures designed to prevent that we would spread or potentially be exposed to the virus which causes COVID-19, right? And they're inconvenient and uncomfortable. Wearing a mask, it's not my favorite thing, but they're preventative and that's why we do them, okay? All righty, so having said that then, um, what do I think are the most important preventative measures? And these are gonna be things you've already heard about. Okay, so listen guys, when you work in a lab, Generally, the biggest hazard that you face is things that endanger the health of your eyes. And your eyes are precious, okay? And you want to protect your eyes at all costs. It's the most important you think, thing you can do. To do that, you wear goggles. Now I wanna just briefly show you uh, another document on our website here, okay? Okay, um, it's this, I, I, it opened up in a little window, but at, at Orange Coast College, we were in the process of changing our safety rule requirements. We used to allow people to wear safety glasses that eh, they basically look like this, okay? Maybe a little bit more curved around. Um, that is really not a generally accepted safety practice anymore. Really to protect yourself, what you need to wear are face fitting goggles that look like this or like that. Okay, they need to be splash proof or splash resistant, full face goggles that seal against your face. Okay, splashes in a chemistry lab are common and they are a really common way for people to injure their eyes. Okay, so you want to protect your eyes from chemicals. Um, the one thing I want to warn you about these, and this is outlined in this, and you can read through it, and you're not going to have to buy goggles, and we're not working in lab, but in the future, really any lab you go, you should try to become accustomed to wearing goggles, okay? This kind of goggle, I don't know if you can see this, it has little holes, perforations all around it. All goggles have openings because your eyes naturally give off moisture. And as a result, if you seal something up against your eyes, that thing will fog up because it'll get humid inside, it'll condense, okay? So all goggles have vents to allow that moisture to get out to, to minimize fogging, okay? This is one way to do it, to have all these holes on it. Those are used in, in things like um, industrial construction shops that don't work with chemicals. So carpentry shops, metal shops, things like that, okay? They're called shop goggles. Those are not splash proof. They are not acceptable for chemistry lab. Just want you to know that instead you have to get ones that have indirect vents that the vents are sort of covered and there's no direct path, all right? And again, if you were working at OCC, we would be requiring you to get these, um, but um, as it is right now, that's not gonna be necessary. All right, so wear goggles. Second thing.
Second thing is appropriate clothing. And you guys have heard this, you know, no open toed shoes is pretty much how it's usually put. Okay. The, the point is that in the chemistry lab, the most uh, common type of accident is to spill chemicals on yourself. Okay. By far. And um, your clothes are the first line of defense against that. You splash on clothes, you can take the clothes off. It doesn't get on your skin. Right. And your feet are particularly vulnerable because a lot of spills end up on the floor. You drop something, you spill it off the table, whatever it's on the floor. So we want to make sure that we are wearing appropriate clothes that cover ourselves, especially shoes that cover our feet completely, you know, are, that are going to keep out chemicals if they spill. Um, a lot of places recommend um, not wearing shorts or short skirt or skirts. Um, I'm not quite that. I don't, I, I'm not so concerned about that. I used to wear shorts in the lab. Um, I mean, I think the clothing that we wear on a day-to-day -day basis is also a comfort issue and also a style issue. And I get that. Um, the one thing I will say is that when I worked with particularly dangerous things, I would wear shorts, but then I would wear a lab coat over it. There are places that require you to wear a lab coat at all times in the lab. We don't. Um, but that is not a bad safety measure. You want to be careful of your sleeves, that they're not too long, that they don't dangle, okay, so that they can drag and knock things over or get in chemicals, right? You want to tie your hair back if you have long hair because you don't want to get hair in your chemicals and things like that. I mean, they're all basic, like, put yourself, have yourself clothed in a manner that is going to protect you and not cause accidents in the lab. Okay. I'm sorry I didn't have a time chance to write this in advance and print it up. But the next thing you want to do is you want to avoid your exposure to chemicals, right? You want to make sure you're not eating or drinking chemicals. So no eating or drinking in the lab. And the reason for that is that, you know, although a surface may look clean, it may have had something spilled on it and not been properly wiped up. And if you set your food in there or it gets in your drink or whatever, you would be um, ingesting that chemical and look, we just don't want to eat chemicals, right? And um, as, a, as a related to that in the organic lab, we have the additional problem that um, organic chemicals give off fumes, lots of fumes, and those fumes will absorb into food, okay? So if you've ever had, uh, if you've ever had the experience of, you know, somebody left an onion open in the refrigerator, onions give off organic chemicals. That's what the smell and everything is. They're organic substances. And then, you know, you had something else in there, a sandwich and the smell absorbed into the sandwich. Dude, that's a typical thing, right? So what you want to do is if you are bringing food into the organic lab, just because you're bringing it there because you've got it with you because it's your lunch or something. You're not eating it, but you're storing it there. Try to keep it sealed up, okay? Just so it doesn't absorb any fumes. Now, um, we're gonna be working, you know, in the future, especially with our new chemistry building, we're gonna be working in environments that try to keep the fumes away from us. Our current lab is not maybe as safe in that way, okay? But nevertheless, it's just good safety practice. Okay, so I, I think these are the most important safety measures. Um, the next thing I want to talk to you about is um, fire safety. Because um, while fires are a relatively rare accident in the organic chemistry lab, they do occur because Organic chemicals are flammable. They burn. All right? So, first thing.
Now, again, unfortunately, most of you have not had the actual experience of working in the organic lab. If you were to come into organic lab, one of the things that you might notice is that unlike in the general chemistry lab, Chem 180, 185 lab, where there was a Bunsen burner sitting right on your lab bench, and you use that to heat stuff up in the organic lab, we don't have Bunsen burners. And the reason for that is that it's a generally accepted practice in the organic lab. We do not use flames because flames will cause chemicals to ignite and start burning. And they don't have to just, it's not saying we have the liquid and you touch it to it, even the vapors can catch on fire, okay? So this is, I'm just telling you, every organic lab that I've ever worked in has this thing. If you have to use a flame, there are specific safety things that you have to do. You have to isolate yourself from chemicals, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. In general, we don't use flames, okay? Number one rule for fire safety. Second rule for fire safety, okay, is Quite frankly, if there's a fire in a lab, okay, the safest thing you can do is run away. Okay? It's just that simple. Um, yeah, if there's a possibility to put it out or something easily by smothering it or whatever, it's a small fire, okay, that's one thing. But honestly, um, your life and your health is much more important than a building or whatever. And I don't expect you students to be standing inside of a, you know, building with a 20 foot wall of flame, trying to put it out with a little pea shooter. Okay. I expect you to be running away and becoming safe. So know where your exits are. That's the secret. Okay. And that's just a general safety thing. And then finally, If you do get on fire, which hopefully should never happen, right? But if your clothes are burning, something like that, don't run. Just literally throw yourself down on the floor and roll around on top of the flames. I know that sounds counterintuitive, but that is how you put out fires. If you don't have a fire extinguisher, you try to cover them up so they don't get oxygen, okay? Just drop and roll. All right, these are the three basic fire rules. If you follow these rules, hopefully, you, you know, you'll never have a, a problem. Next thing. Chemical hygiene. Excuse me. This is the technical term. And someday, some of you may hear this term, okay? For cleanliness. In other words, not getting chemicals all over yourself, okay? Chemical hygiene. Hygiene is like keeping yourself clean, right? So chemical hygiene is working with chemicals in a clean way that you don't get chemicals on yourself, all right? And basically, there's not many rules for this. Let me just give you a couple. If you spill or drip chemicals on the counter, clean them up right away. Don't let it sit there that, oh, then you forget about it and you set your lab book in it or you put your elbow in it or whatever, clean it up right away. If you clean up chemicals right away, that will, I would say, I would estimate that would reduce your chance of chemical exposure by about 90%, okay? Okay, second chemical thing.
when there are containers of chemicals, bottles and things like that, when you use them, put the cap back on. It's the second most, I, I would say it's probably the one of the most common ways that I see spills and people getting exposed. The bottle is just sitting there open. It gets knocked over mess, right? But if the cap is on, it's safe. Put the caps back on containers. Wash your hands after lab. Don't be tracking the stuff all around, right? Wash your hands after lab and I just had it in my head and it popped out of there when I said wash your hands out of lab. Oh yeah. If you do get chemicals on yourself, if you get chemicals on your eye, in your eyes, we have special eye wash stations. Okay. Almost all chemical uh, containing labs will have these. They're, they look like drinking fountains. You put your face in, it washes your eyes out. Okay. Know where they are, know how to use them. Similarly, <clears throat> chemical labs generally also have uh, showers. If there's a, if you get a huge amount of chemicals spilled on yourself, get dragged into the shower, they put the shower on, you got to take your clothes off. It's a miserable, horrible thing. I've seen somebody have to do it. It's super unpleasant. It's kind of embarrassing. And dude, those, the, the chemical safety showers. So, you know, your shower, right. You know about these restrictors. They're only two gallons per minute, right. In your shower, dude, chemical sh safety showers are 10 times that they're 20 gallons per minute generally. Okay. They're like a friggin' fire hose. They're unpleasant. They're not heated there. So imagine 20 gallons per minute of cold water. Okay. And you're supposed to rinse for five to 15 minutes of that. So the best plan is not to spill chemicals on yourself. Right. But in the event, you should know where they are. Okay. Uh, finally, then just a little bit of quick first aid and then we are done. Okay, if you burn yourself, if it's not bad, okay, and let's talk about that. If you burn yourself and there's black charred skin, okay, you call 911. If you burn yourself and it's a little red and it stings, you stick it in ice water for five minutes. The reason for that, and, and this is a general thing about your body and the way it works, and many of you are interested in, in uh, careers in the health sciences, so you should understand this. Your body has natural defense mechanisms against infection that involve cells when they are injured, committing suicide and releasing chemicals that are toxic to cells and toxic to bacteria. So you guys may have heard of lysosomes. If you've, if you've studied biology and taken cell bio, there's lysosomes. They contain peroxide basically. And uh, when the cell is injured, it'll release that, it'll kill the cell and it'll try to kill bacteria. And the idea is if you got a cut or a burn or something that would create a vulnerability in your skin, the surrounding cells would tr be trying to kill anything that was trying to come in, okay? The problem with that then is that when you are injured, your initial injury is not the only thing that causes injury to the area. Your body continues to injure itself. It continues to kill cells and injure itself, okay? What we wanna do is we wanna stop that additional injury. This is extremely common in burns. So you get them in ice water, it slows down the rate of the chemical reactions. It allows 
your other defense me mechanisms to take over and stop that additional damage. Does that make sense? Okay. So ice water, okay? Ice water for five minutes. If you have a significant chemical spill on your skin, especially of a chemical like concentrated acid that is very corrosive and harmful, you get that thing, that spill into, into tap water and you rinse it for 15 minutes. That will dramatically reduce the amount of damage to your skin. The tap water will dissolve the chemical, right? It dilutes the acid and Eventually, after the water washes away the oils on your skin, the water will penetrate your skin, dilute it, and then actually cause it to, by, uh, by sort of diffusion, to move out into the flowing water. It'll, pull, it'll suck it out of your skin, okay? Super important. Please remember that if you get chemicals on you, the first thing you should do is just start rinsing then ask for first aid or other help, okay? And then, sorry, that's supposed to say soap. This is pretty basic first aid. If you get a cut or something in the lab, you're gonna wash it with soap and water, and then you're gonna ask for a bandage, okay? However, if it is a serious cut, you're gonna call 911 or you're gonna go seek medical help, okay? So if you, you know, if you cut your hand and there's blood like pumping out like that, okay, we're gonna, Put pressure on it. We're going to get you medical help. Does that make sense? All righty. So these are just some basic first aid that might come up in the lab. So to summarize then, um, please read through the, the safety rules. Uh, familiarize themselves for it. Again, we are not going to be, be able to apply those with practice in the lab this semester. But um, just keep these things in mind. When you move on in your studies after COVID, you will be in clinical or laboratory settings and most of these will apply. Uh, the other thing I'm just gonna warn you um, is most likely if you work in any type of clinical or laboratory setting, you're gonna have periodic safety refreshers. Boring meetings like this where they talk to you about safety and scare you and do whatever, okay? Just be, just be aware of that. And I know that they aren't interesting and I know that they're an inconvenience, but please take them seriously because they literally could save your life, okay? Um, I've seen people uh, lose eyes. I guess that's probably the most serious accident I've seen, but I saw a person basically have a, an accident and lose an eye. And that really sucked, okay? And by the way, it was because they were not wearing eye protection. So that's basically how it works. Okay, that's all I have to say about safety. I'm gonna stop there.